You know, I just got an email. You know, we prayed yesterday for Dr. J. You know, Dr. J in India, you know, he, uh, he, he went to a, a radical Hindu city and, um, and he had the crusades all planned and then they cancelled it on him the last moment. And then we prayed and then he emailed back and he says, I managed to get the license for one night last night. And, uh, and, uh, and then we continued to pray for the rest of the nights that were there. Anyway, I just got this from you. He says, Dear uh, Dr. George, Dr. Hazel and the victory leaders, the festival went without any untoward incidents, incidents of the Hindu radicals, even though they had put an ad in the local newspaper that they would stop this meeting. More than 3,000 people heard the gospel in this first day and around 1,500 people gave their hearts to, to God. Obviously, miracles took place in the name of the Jesus. It says there were secret police in the festival taking note uh, to send to the district administrators. We are praying for favor with them. They will decide whether they will give us the permission tomorrow or not. After knowing the report of the secret police, God is still on the throne and we will remember his own. Thank you for your continued prayer support. Isn't that powerful? And Father, I pray to you, Lord, you give him all the favor he needs, all of the authority he needs, Father, to continue on. Thank you, Lord, Father, for all of those radical Hindus getting saved. In Jesus' wonderful and powerful and mighty name. Jesus' name. I tell you, there's a great opposition to the gospel, isn't there? See, the battle, it's not just a matter of getting up and preaching a message. Man, you've got you to know how to fight. You've got to know how to fight, otherwise you'll never accomplish anything in the kingdom of God. You know, and uh, of course, the name of my message tonight is prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. That's from Joel chapter 3 and verse 9. Prepare for war. We are in a battle. How many know that? There's a battle going on and, uh, and, and you're in it. And if you don't know how to fight in this battle, you, you're going to get wiped out. You're going to get destroyed. And so tonight, prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. And uh, Romans 13 verse 11 through 14, if you just turn there, it says this. Knowing the time that now it is high time. Look at this. To what? To awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. It says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Knowing the time. Do you know the time we're in? My goodness, I tell you, the signs are everywhere. We are living in the last of the last days. You know, the scripture says two things are going to happen in the last days, both at the same time. It says one in, in Revelation, in, uh, in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, it says the Spirit speaks expressly that in the last days, many are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And so we know in the last days, the days we're living in now, there's going to be a great falling away from the faith. But then on the other hand, also in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, it says, in the last days, same period of time, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Young men are going to have visions. Old men are going to have dreams. On my handmaidens, I'm going to pour out of my spirit, saith the Lord. And they'll see signs and wonders on the face of this earth. I tell you what, so two things are going to happen. One hand is going to be great falling away and the other side is going to be great revival. There's going to be a major separation. In fact, in Revelation 22, 11, it says the righteous are going to become more and more righteous and the holy more and more holy and the filthy more and more filthy and the unrighteous more and more unrighteous. So you're seeing a separation. And I tell you, it's becoming very clear, very clear in the US and it's getting clearer here in Canada. You know, you're getting two separate ways of thinking. One that's received doctrines of devils and one that's received the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And it's causing a separation right down the middle. It really is. I tell you, you've got to make a, a decision what side you're getting on. Aren't you? You've got to make a choice which side you're on. And let me tell you this, get on the right side. You get on the wrong side, you're going to have major trouble. Major, major trouble. You really are. And so uh, I tell you, there's only one way to live. You need to teach your kids that. There's only one way to live. There's not lots of ways to live. Only one way. 
You know, the scripture the Lord revealed to me and shared with me and told me to pray that way in, uh, in Psalm 1611. It's probably a good one for all of you. Psalm 1611, it says this, you will show me the path of life. You will show me. I pray that. From, how many know there's a lot of paths you can walk on? And not all of them are a path of life. It says there is a way that seems right unto man and the end thereof are the ways of death. It just leads you to death, disaster and destruction. And some people get on that path of death, destruction and disaster and they stay on it. And it's like a cycle that's been in their family and it's been in their grandparents and in their parents and it's in you and you're on that same cycle, that same death cycle. Get off of it. Get onto the life cycle. You, God, you will show me the path of life. Of course, the rest of that verse, many of you know the rest verse, it says, in your presence there's fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. That's what happens when you get into the path of life. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Doesn't matter what you're going through, there's still a joy in your heart. And at your right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. I tell you, get on the right track. I tell you, you didn't come here by accident like it was prophesied. You're here for a purpose. You're here because there's something in your heart. Even if you did come with somebody. Somebody paid your way, you got here somehow. You're not even sure why you're here. Well, I tell you what, it's... <laughs> God knows why you're here. It's not an accident you're here. You're here by divine appointment. And so God's going to speak to you and do something in your heart while you are here. And so this is a wonderful time. Take the most of it. Don't waste this time. We've got some great speakers here. And I'll tell you what, we're, there's, there's, the Spirit of God is here. And He really wants to make a difference in your life. He really does. And so we're going to get on the right side. It says this in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. It says, for the days of John the Baptist, from the days of John the Baptist until now, look at this, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of God suffers violence from John until now. And John was beheaded, wasn't he? They cut his head off for preaching the gospel. And, and, and he says, and until now, we're still in this battle. I tell you, Jesus defeated the enemy Legally, but I tell you, on earth, I tell you, we have the victory. We're fighting from a position of victory. It says in Colossians 2 and verse 15, how he stripped him of his armor. He stripped him, he disarmed him, it says, in Colossians 2, 15, through the cross. Jesus disarmed principalities and powers. Who are we fighting against? Principalities and powers in heavenly places. That's what the scripture says in Ephesians 6. The same ones that Jesus stripped of their power. And so really the devil's success today is dependent upon our ignorance. This is why we need to know the word of God. If you know who you are, you know what God's done for you, you know, you know, you know what's available to you. That's why even the prayer in Ephesians chapter one, where the apostle Paul prayed and he said, I pray that the spirit of wisdom and knowledge in the revelation of God would be imparted to you that the eyes of your understanding, each one, the eyes of your understanding would be opened that you might know three things. That you might know the hope of the calling of God on your life, number one. And number two, you need to know the inheritance that he has for each one of us as saints, as Christians. There's an inheritance. We're in his will. The New Testament is his last will and testament. Glory to God. And I tell you, I, I, there's no, that will has no effect until the testator dies. And then you have to read the will and you're in it. Find out what he left for you and you'll find he's left a great inheritance for you. He says he'll supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Glory to God. How many know there's no shortage in the kingdom of heaven? And I'll tell you what, there's a great supply in his riches and glory. There's nothing too hard. There's nothing the devil can put on you that God can't take off you. Huh? I tell you, you've got to understand that. We fight from a position of victory. We call our name, we are Victory Family. Victory Family, home of champions. First Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God that gives us the victory always through Jesus Christ our Lord. You don't have to live a life I tell you, does it, you can't control everything that happens out there. You can't control the world out there, but you can control the world in here. 
I tell you, it says even, you know what it says in the last days, Matthew 24? It says there's going to be wars, rumours of wars, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be pestilence. There's going to be famines in different kinds of places. And then in verse 6 in Matthew 24, it says, but don't let your heart be troubled. Huh? It says men's hearts are going to fail them for all of the fear that's coming on the face of the earth. When I saw on television the other week there, they, they just had some scientists down in America, the USA, studying for nine years on whether fear will cause a, cause a heart attack. Huh? I mean, taxpayers' money. Nine years of taxpayers' money. And it was a big thing. He was the man of the month or something like that. You know, he discovered that, yes, fear can cause heart attack. All you got to do is read the Bible in Luke chapter 21. He says men's hearts are going to fail them for the fear of those things that are coming upon the face of the earth. But it doesn't have to happen to you. We know who wins. We know who it turns out. We just got to stay close to the victor. You know, we got to stay linked up to him, praise God. Yeah, so, and uh, I tell you, so it's a battle that we're in. And uh, it says here, the violent take it by force. I put this down. The violent who take it by force are people of great passion and commitment who are willing to respond and propagate with radical abandonment the message and dynamic of God's kingdom. And then to put this truly, for the church to be triumphant, it needs to be militant and miraculous, as well as compassionate and gentle. Four things. It needs to be militant, it needs to be miraculous, it needs to be compassionate, and it needs to be gentle. The key to, to, key to operating like this is, the, is timing. It's timing. We have to know how to act in every different kind of situation. Have you ever, have you, I mean, I did a teaching on the four faces of Jesus. Four faces of Jesus. You've seen it in the book of Ezekiel chapter 1 and also in Revelation chapter 4. It talks about the four faces of Jesus, the four-faced beast. And it talks about this is a type of Christ. And uh, where it talks about the lion, the face of the lion. The face of the ox, the face of the man, and then the face of the eagle. And of course, the, the, the four Gospels really portray that. Book of Matthew, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, praise God. And you see Jesus as the lion. You know, hey, I tell you, that's, they're not the kind of people you want to counsel you. <laughs> not that compassionate. Huh? And remember, you know, on the television there, just a little while ago, there's an interview with Meryl Streep and Denzel Washington. And it was about the, a movie they were doing on, the, on, the, on it was a, a, you know, one of the wars. It was a war in the Middle East. And it was kind of a political kind of movie. And then, you know, this uh, Meryl Streep, she says, well, Jesus would never do that kind of thing. Denzel Washington piped up. He says, you've never read your Bible. He says, he says Jesus made a whip. And he beat the money changers, kicked over the tables and threw them out. He says, you need to get to know your Bible and read the Bible. I tell you, see, because Jesus did do that, didn't he? Yeah. How many know Jesus got angry? Yeah. Jesus got angry. It says in, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 7, I believe it is, it says how he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even my God, hath anointed him with the oil of joy above his fellows. Jesus loved and he hated. There's certain things, you know, we, we hear a lot about the love message, but I tell you what, how about the hate message? You know, see, people, people, people that, that hate truth think truth is hate. Oh, yes, a lot of people think that truth is hate because they hate truth. I tell you, if they love truth, and it says, because they love not the truth, 1 Thessalonians 2, it says, God gave them over to strong delusion, so they believe a lie. I don't know about you, before I was ever saved, I wanted truth more than anything else in my life. And then when I found it, I was willing to give up everything. Because I thought becoming a Christian meant losing all my friends, giving away all my money, living a miserable life. So I questioned it for a little while. But I was looking for truth more than anything, and I realized I tried to get out of Christianity. Everything, I tried everything to get out of Christianity. I tried to disprove it however I could. And then through trying to disprove it, I realized this thing is true. I'm going to have to make a decision. I said, give me one more week. <laughs> one more week, I've made the decision. If I'll have to lose all my friends, so be it. If I have to give away all my money, so be it. If I have to live a miserable life, so be it. I made the decision for Christ based on that. You know, I'll tell you what. 
The biggest battles you make are always in that time of commitment. Commitment is the biggest battle. So I tell you, there's a world war that goes on in the inside of people. You know, when you receive Christ, how many felt that before you accepted Christ? Man, I tell you, all the lies that come against you, all of the battle against your mind, you're going to lose. I mean, even me, you're going you're gonna to have to give all your money away, lose all your friends. Nobody told me different. God never told me any different. So as far as I was concerned, that was it. I'm in. Eventually I said, I'm in. That's it after the week. And you know, when I make a decision, I make a decision. And so that was it. And then I did give away all my money, but God kept giving it back to me. And then I found a scripture in Mark 10, 29, 30. It says, no man gives up anything. Lands, homes, families, or anything for my sake or the gospels without being rewarded a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come, eternal life. And see, so we got a hold of that promise. And, and then, you know, then, then you give stuff away cheerfully for the gospel's sake. And you know what? I gave all kinds of stuff away, but I tell you what, God gave it back. I did lose a lot of friends, but I tell you what, I got more friends and family. I got friends and family all around the world, 40 different nations. We've got victory family everywhere. You can get off the plane and we have victory family there meeting you everywhere. You know, and, 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 uh, and it's tremendous. You know, God has given us that and he's given you it as well. And, uh, and I tell you what, as far as living a miserable life, I mean, I, I was a happy sinner. I was one of those sad sinners. I was a happy sinner. It's just you got to the place, you know, that you realize, man, there's got to be more to life than this. I remember driving through the middle of Central America in my Volkswagen van, drinking a bottle of wine, and I'm singing along with, with uh, Janis Joplin. Is that all there is, my friend? Then let's keep on dancing. Let's bring out the booze and have a ball. And I'm thinking, is that all there is? Because you know me now, I'm 30 years of age almost. Never met a Christian in my life. At least not one that impressed me any. <laughs> and so I uh, singing that song and I said, oh, there has got to be more to life than that. I think that was the change. That was the defining moment. You know, when you got to the place and you think, well, man, there's more to life than this. You're looking for truth. I want truth more than anything else. And I tell you what, you sacrifice for truth. You know, and uh, I don't know where you're at tonight, but I tell you what, you, you've got to, you, you, Jesus Christ, your word is truth. And I tried to disprove the Bible. I really did. In fact, on my website, on our, on our VCI uh, website, international website, I got five ways, five things that convinced me the Bible's the word of God. You know, and uh, people have been taking that down and using it everywhere. And of course, I've won so many different uh, teachers and scientists and everything to Christ, even just those five little things. It's amazing. I think you've got to know why you believe this. You've got to know, I mean, hey, I had to be convinced this was the Word of God. That's one thing you've got to be convinced this is the Word of God. I remember at one of our men's meetings once we went for breakfast, and one guy said to me, he said, you know, Pastor John, I'm so confused. I said, really? I said, you... <laughs> I said, do you believe the Bible? He says, well, I'm not sure. I said, well, that's your problem right there. That's, that's your problem right there. He said, you know, if you, if, you don't, if you don't believe the Bible, you're going to be confused. And you're going to stay confused for the rest of your life. Because in the world, they tell you there is no truth. All truth is relevant. There's many ways to God. Your truth is not my truth. We all have different truths. There is only one truth. The way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. So truth is truth. There's many lies. There's only one truth. It's like the counterfeit. You get one real and then you know, every time you've got something real, you get a hundred counterfeits. You don't get any counterfeit $3 bills, do you? <laughs> Why not? There's no real $3 bill. And so I tell you what, there's a lot of things that have tried to counterfeit Christianity, but I tell you what, that's the thing. Nobody can counterfeit it. You see, I mean, it can come up with religion with a bunch of rules that you have to obey, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, but it doesn't change you from the inside. That's what I like about Christ Christianity. It's not just another rotary club, you know, or the lion's club, you know, where they do some good things and help people, you know, with, with, with money, with clothes, with food. Thank God that Christianity can do that and more. You know, it can supply food, clothes, housing, but it can take a 60-year-old man and put a brand new man in that body. Yes. Glory to God and give him a brand new start. You don't like the way you're born the first time? 
you can get born again. Isn't that great? Sure you can. Sure, that's what's great about Christianity. John 3.3, 3, it, says, it says, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. This is what you're entering into. It says, the violent press into it. But many get knocked out because of the opposition. The violent press into it. It says, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And then in verse five in John chapter three, it says, you must be born of the flesh and the spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. And what does it say about the kingdom of God? It says, the kingdom of God's not out there somewhere. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, Romans 14, 17, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Isn't that what people are looking for? Yes. I remember a, an interview with, on, the, on, the news, on the, one of the uh, talk shows with um, Harrison Ford. And the interviewer was interviewing him saying, Harrison, you have everything. You got money, you got fame, you got position. Is there anything you don't have? He says, I don't have peace. At the end of the interview. I don't have peace. I tell you, there's lots of people. They've got everything in the natural, but empty on the inside. You see, if you don't have Christ on the inside, emptiness is just your heart crying out. For Christ, you were created to know him. Your creator, created to know him, created to love him, created to walk with him. And if you're not doing that, then there's an emptiness on the inside here. And if there's an emptiness on the inside, then you're always looking for stuff out here to satisfy you. You know, I want a bigger house, a better house, a new car and a better car and more car. I want another wife. I want more kids. I want this. I want that. I want something else. Bigger holidays, better holidays. You get all that stuff. And you're like Solomon, all vanity, all emptiness. After Solomon had everything, I mean, he had a lot more wives than you've ever got, even if he did live in Hollywood. At <laughs> none of them, he didn't get satisfaction from any of them. All his children, all of those kids and everything. He says, all is vanity, all is emptiness. And then at the end of the book of Ecclesiastic, he says, he, he, he said, the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Huh? Boy. So Solomon finally did come back to Christ. He brought that book of Ecclesiastics in a backslidden state. And he talks about, and that's why so many people get saved reading it. The reader, I can identify with that. Got everything, but feel so empty. No satisfaction. And I can't get over the Rolling Stones. Still, every time I see them, they're still seeing it. I mean, they're all close to 80 years of age. Can I get no satisfaction? Somebody please tell them. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. Somebody tell them. You would need Jesus in your life. Huh? Glory to God. That's good news, isn't it? You know, you don't have to stay that way. There can be satisfaction you get with nothing. It says, it says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness. I tell, you, I tell you, once you're serving God, you don't need a lot of things to make you happy. You know, you really don't. You know, I mean, you know, it's, it's, I don't need a lot of things. I can be happy. You know, I was happy living in my Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> You can be happy with, a, with, a, with an awful lot less. In fact, the more stuff you get, the more insurance you need, the more somebody has to bed sit your house and all the things that you've got. Uh, you know, you need guns and walls and locks and alarms and everything just to protect all this stuff. And then it all rusts and <laughs> rots. <laughs> but I tell you what, your salvation is powerful, isn't it? It really is. You know, so... I like this, militant, miraculous, as well as compassionate and gentle. Like even with what uh, Meryl Streep said to Denzel Washington, you know, she had Jesus in a little box. Jesus would never do that. Huh? And sometimes we can put him in a little box. Well, he's a God of love. He will never do that. He's also a God of war. It says in Revelation 21, 11, I believe it is, it says, Jesus judges and makes war in righteousness. Wow, and it, you know, in, 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 uh, in Revelation, in uh, Genesis chapter, no, Exodus chapter 15, and verse 2, it says, Our God is a man of war. Huh? And we're created in his image. Men, we are created in his image. 
You know, I think, you know, I, I think the world sometimes tries to domesticate us. You know, like you, you look at the lions and that just living in a cage. Huh? <laughs> you know, and they're not, they don't even really, sometimes they don't even know they're a lion and what they can do. I tell you, we need to, we need to find out who we are. Because I tell you what, you know, it says, wake up the mighty men. Prepare for war, wake up the mighty men. Remember what the angel, when he came to Gideon, Gideon's hiding behind the wine press. And he called him, you mighty man of valor. I want you to be, and he thought, me? I've never even seen a miracle. I'm the youngest in the family. And I've never seen a miracle. How can you be talking about me? He was speaking to his potential. I tell you right in here, we are mighty man. You're a born again Christian. You are, have the potential to walk as a son of God. He that says he knows him ought himself to walk even as he walked. Glory to God. So I tell you, we've been changed from glory to glory into the image of Christ, don't we? Glory to God. I tell you, even after after these few days together, you'll be a little bit more like Jesus. That means when you go home, if you've got a wife, you'll go back, you'll be much easier to love. You'll be harder to offend. You'll be quicker to forgive. (laughs) And if your wife is serving God, then she'll be better when you get back there too. Huh? Doesn't that make, give you great hope for the future? Sure it does. You know, you see, so, so with, these, with these four faces of Jesus, I mean, there's times when you, when you need to be like a lion. You've got to confront issues. Anger is, is, is a God-given emotion. It's just you have to be so careful that you don't sin. There's some things you'll never do unless you get angry enough. You know, Passion is, a, passion is a boiling enthusiasm and it can be a holy anger. It's just something that makes you so mad. I mean, I got upset after this last election. Huh? I mean, man, I thought, wow, what a defeat. I mean, we, we worked so hard over the 15 years to put in a Christian prime minister and get Christian television and, and, and get Christian politicians. Man, we work so hard. And just like that, it's like Matthew chapter 13. It says, while we what? While we slept, the enemy sowed tears. Devil sowed children of the devil in our field. That's what it says, Matthew 13. You know, and, and, and really that's what we see. I think this really shocked me. At the beliefs in Canada. You know, when you see all of the things that people say on Facebook, I think, are they stupid? I mean, these are supposed to be smart people. I mean, where's their intelligence? It's like two and two doesn't make 222. You know, I mean, it's four. You know, and, and it's, you know, it's simple. I mean, you know, some of the decisions, I mean, it's, it's very simple to tell what's right and what's wrong. If you want truth, isn't it? But you know, it says Satan, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And you know, a lot of times, even for people to get saved, they've got to get that blindfold off. Remember, his power is deception. He's been defeated. What we've got to do is get the deception off. I'll tell you what, you know, when we get born again, legally, we're free. Legally, we're being, trans- we're being delivered from one kingdom, translated into another. Legally, we're free. Legally, we're victorious. Legally, we have all authority and power. I can walk in dominion. But I tell you what, experientially, it's going to take faith in God. It's going to take faith in God. It's going to take time. It's going to take tests. And it's going to take good decisions. Huh? It doesn't just happen even though legally you're free. Legally, you're delivered from everything by the power of Christ. He paid the price for you. But experientially, for that to become a reality, for your doctrine to become a reality in your marriage, in your home, in your family, in your finances, you know, in your, in, in your physical being, it's going to take faith in God. And it's going to take time and tests and good decisions for it to happen. That's why you've got to know the word. If you don't know the word, you're not going to make good decisions. You know, now, you know, the... Um, Militant means engaged in warfare, aggressive in a cause. Militant, it means engaged in warfare and aggressive in a cause. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause worth fighting for? I mean, what does make you mad? What makes you sad? 
what makes you mad, and I know with me it's injustice. When I see injustice anywhere, it makes me mad, you know? And you want to fight for the underdog, you know, all the time. I always, you know, I always pick the team that looks the most likely to lose. You know, because the underdog, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, I, I, you know, you fight for injustice. You want what's right. You love truth. You want truth. And, and then there's others. I mean, what makes you sad? What makes you weep? You see, I mean, you know, when you see some of the things that are happening to children and, and, and women and, and families, it makes you weep. You know, and, 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 and that's an indication. I mean, they're, they're God-given emotions. That's an indication sometimes of what God wants us to help fix. And we all get mad at different things. You know, if you don't get mad, there's something wrong with you. You don't get passionate, there's something wrong with you. You know, and, uh, and they, they, you know, a lot of people, you know, people say, well, you know, I, uh, I got lots of faith, but no fight. Well, I'll tell you what, you better get some fight. You get, better get some fight. A Caleb would never got his mountain if he hadn't learned to fight. You know, the Apostle Paul, you know, wouldn't have gone through what he gone through and did what he did if he didn't know how to fight. He said, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my course. I tell you, we have to get that spirit of fight. We're well, not just going to roll over and play dead when something happens. I mean, with this stuff, I mean, we won't just roll, and roll over and play dead. We've been in our war room for three days. Some of our key leaders, that's our war room here. We've been three days there strategizing, not just for politics, but for everything. You know, so how that we can, so that how we can, we can, we can multiply, you know, from, from a Christian standpoint, what multiplies the most has dominion. You know what that shows me in Canada? It means that Christianity hasn't multiplied the most, the most in the last 10 years. Why? Because we lost dominion. Now we've got to get it back. Got to fight for it. You know, and it is a battle, you know, but we can win. You know, I don't know if you read my last newsletter, my e-letter, this last one. Uh, it is God's people get the leaders they deserve. And I showed you scripturally how that happens. God leaders, and, and Paul read it and he read it. He preached it last Sunday, I think it was, wasn't it? And then you got it put in the newspaper up there. God's people get the leaders they deserve. You know, it says because their sayings and doings are against the Lord. He says he takes all of good leadership away from you. He takes all good leadership, all of the counselors, all the mighty men. He removes them from your midst because the people's sayings and doings are against the Lord. And then he said, I'll give you babes and I'll give you children to rule over you. And those that lead you will cause you to go astray. Huh? I'm going to tell you what, that needs to be, something's got to change with our sayings and our doings. We're going to church, but we're not, church not in, in us. You know? The word is not the, we're reading the word, but the word hasn't become flesh in us. We shouldn't be just preaching a message. We should be the message. We shouldn't just be talking about these things. We should be, people should look at it and say, they're a Christian. I want what you've got. You've got something I don't have. That should happen when they see it in you. And I, and I believe even out of this conference, I believe there's going to be things change. Really, there's going to be things that change and adjustments that are made. Militant means engaged in warfare, aggressive against a, 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 for a cause. Who and what are we fighting against? And what are we fighting for? You know, in Ephesians 6, it talks about, you know, put on the whole armor of God. It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down the strongholds. Put on the whole armor of God. And then it talks about the armor of God. Most of it is defensive armor, isn't it? And then you've got the sword of the spirit, which is the offensive armor so that you can take some territory. But you know, there is a, in any good army, there is a defensive strategy. There's a maintenance strategy and there's an offensive strategy. I tell you, when you get in war room, you've got to figure that out for your family, for your own life, for your business, for your city, for your church. You get, what is the, what is the, of the defensive strategy? So we can maintain what we got and keep what we got. What is the maintenance strategy? What is the offensive strategy? So we don't want to just stay with what we've got for the next 20 years, right? No, we want to multiply. I love what General Patton said. He said, I don't want to ever hear any messages saying we're just holding your own. No, no, no. He says, we never dig in. We always go on the offensive. Even in our 10 tenets of our faith, it says we are committed to increase as opposed to maintenance. We realize we're going to maintain. 
But we're not just going to stay maintaining the same 50 people for the next 10 years. Or 100 people for the next 10 years. Or the next 500 people, are we? No, we want multiplication. And God, call, God has called us to do that. Genesis 1, 27, 28. God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. And of course, when the early church started, it did multiply. You know, and you get somewhere real fast when everything multiplies, doesn't it? Don't you? You really do. And we can get to that place. I tell you, you've got a whole series there on multiplication, where it begins, how it starts, and, and all the things that God promises to multiply if we will do our part. You know, even the first one in Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Let me ask you this question. If Paul hadn't planted and Apollos hadn't watered, could God give the increase? No, he couldn't, could he? It's like you saying, I want to, I want, I'm believing for a great crop of carrots in my garden. We say, well, did you plant any seed? Oh, you've got to plant seed. <laughs> yeah, and then you've got to water it and weed it so it grows. Huh? So it's, it's, there are principles that are practical that are also spiritual. You know, I tell you, you, you can pray and tell you what, pray with no action. Don't go very far. So, so you look at this for a moment there. A strong defense is an important strategy. Oh, let me give you this like, one last scripture in, in uh, Amos chapter 11. Eight, Amos chapter 8 and verse 11 through 13. I tell you, this is something that's come to me a lot recently. It says how that in the last days, there's going to be a famine in the land. It's not going to be a famine of food and water. It's going to be famine of hearing the word of the Lord. It says, and then people are going to be running to and fro. And they're going here, and they're going there, and they're going here, and they're going somewhere else. They're, they're searching, searching, searching. You know, they're not even sure what they're searching for. They just know that there's an emptiness in them, and there's no satisfaction, and there's something that needs to be filled. And they say, it's because there's a famine of the Word. It says, the Word is what's going to satisfy. And then it says, even the young men and the fur virgins are going to faint. Or kill themselves, commit suicide, no hope. It's, it's terrible when you have no hope, isn't it? That's why it says even for our children, Psalm 78 and verse 6 and 7, it says, tell your children to, 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 to set their hope on God. I tell you, everything else is very fragile. Family's fragile. Dreams are fragile. Your business is fragile. Everything on the face of this earth is fragile. It could be gone just like that. That's why you've got to set your hope on something beyond this life. Set your hope in God. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's not going anywhere, praise God. You know? And we can set our hope in him. Tell your kids to set their... And you set your own hope in that. So hope is vital, isn't it, for us to win? It talks about even with, even with the weapons of our warfare, it says the helmet of hope. Put the helmet of hope on. So you constantly have hope. The devil wants to steal the hope out of your heart. He wants to steal the dream out of your heart. He wants to steal the, steal the vision out of your heart. He wants to tell you things about yourself that you're not. He wants to put the wrong label on you. Tell you you're a loser and you're no good and you'll never amount to anything. I tell you, you've got to be careful you don't believe that. I tell you, and then sometimes other people give you a label. They tell you you're no good and you can't do it. I tell you what, refuse to refuse to 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 to, to fulfill those prophecies. The lies. And really, this is one of the big battles today. It's a battle for knowledge. Remember, it says in the last days, Habakkuk chapter 2, 14. It, it says, the whole earth shall be filled with what? The whole earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Not just the glory. It's going to be filled with the knowledge of of the glory of the Lord. Now, if there's a famine in the land to the place where there's no word, right? There's no word. I mean, that means there's not going to be any glory. It means, it means there's not going to be any revival. There's not going to be any hope. There's not going to be any life. I mean, look what the devil wants to do. This is the battle, one of the battles we're in. We're talking about battle now. There is a battle for truth. It's a battle for information. I mean, look at Jay over in India there. They're trying to stop him any way they can from getting up there and preaching good news. You can be saved, healed, 
delivered. You don't have to live and be sick, sad, and sinful. You can, life can be changed and you can be happy, whole, fulfilled. That's the message they want to shut up. I mean, look, even in Toronto the other week there with that Christian group. They, I mean, they let all the Muslims and everything do whatever they like, but you get a Christian group up there and they want to mention the name of Jesus and they shut them down. Huh? I mean, it's terrible. You know, I mean, it's, I tell you what, they, you know, I don't know about you, but it makes me mad. You know, I mean, I know when we battled for Christian television, it was illegal here. And everybody just sitting back, let it happen. I put up all the pirate stations and they were going to put me in jail. They came went to close it down. He said, we're going to fine you $1,000 a day, put you in jail for 12 months. I said, well, go ahead. I said, that will be the best advertising I've had in my life. You know, they said, we don't want to do that. I tell you, sometimes you just got to, you just, you just, you just got to stand up. Huh? You just got to make a stand. You know, and I'm telling you what, sometimes that can be the best advertising ever. Just be, get a little bit militant. We're not going to accept that. Huh? I don't know about you, but that group there, I mean, you know, I mean, if we're in Toronto, I mean, you know, I, I, I think every worship team and every group should get up there, all go down to different corners in Toronto, and every one of them start singing worship praise songs. And then see what they do. Huh? Why not? I tell you, somehow you've got to get a little bit militant. You don't just play dead when something happens. I mean, look at, look at David when he, when, and this is, this, is, this is defensive. I mean, you look at David, even in his home, the place Ziklag was his little home village that they gave him. In, in 1 Samuel 30, the village of Ziklag, which means overwhelming despair, but he was given that. And then when he was going out, you know, him and his army and him and his men, the enemy came in, destroyed the city, took his wives and children all captive, burned his town. And he came back and his, he, was, he, he said he wept until he had no more tears to weep. His own men were against him. They wanted to stone him. But you know what David did? I mean, it shows you what you do sometimes a big defeat. When you get defeated, and I feel like this has been a defeat. I really do. He asked from my standpoint, you know, and, uh, and, 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 but you don't just lie down. You see, David, I mean, overwhelming. I mean, I wasn't that bad with overwhelming despair. <laughs> and weeping and crying. I never got to that part. <laughs> Because I know we can win. I know we can win. And I know there's only four years. Glory to God. We've got four years to get a strategy. Huh? You've got four years to get a strategy. Glory to God. And, uh, and, and, and work it through. So, so, you know, I mean, what did David do? I mean, David, he, he it says, David encouraged himself in the Lord, number one, in 1 Samuel 30. He encouraged himself in the Lord, verse 8. And how do you do that? I tell you, this times nobody will encourage you. Your wife won't encourage you. Your husband won't encourage you. Your pastor won't encourage you. If you don't know how to encourage yourself, you're going to be knocked out of the race, sitting on the sidelines, unable to go on with God. Encouraging yourself means you put courage in. That means you've got to be careful what you speak. You speak life or death to yourself. In Psalm 40, David tells what he did. He says, my tears have been my meat day and night when they say unto me, where is your God? He says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to that down to the house of the Lord where there's the voice of joy and the voice of praise. I'm going to get in the midst of that group and I'm going to speak to myself. I'm going to say, soul, why are you discouraged? Why are you disquieted with me? Rise up and praise the Lord. And then he says it again in a couple of verses later. Doesn't that make you feel better? Man, see, that's what David did before he even prayed. Before he inquired of the Lord. I tell you, sometimes the worst thing you can do is inquire of the Lord for something when you're discouraged. You know why? Because you ask all the wrong things. Don't you? I just want to die. Go ahead, die. Huh? You feel like dying? I mean, you know what I mean? With, but David, after that, he said, he encouraged himself. Then he inquired of the Lord. And you know how he inquired of the Lord? It says in that next verse, verse 9. He inquired of the Lord. He says, shall I pursue one man? Going against this whole army, all these men want to stone. Shall I pursue? That's pretty, that's pretty aggressive, isn't it? That's pretty aggressive. He's taking the initiative here. Man, I'm not going to roll over and play dead. You know, I'm not going to sit back and just let this happen. I'm going to stand up and do something. And so he says, shall I pursue? And God says, yes. You know something? I mean, God's response. I wonder what God would have said if he said, oh, yes, that I've finished. How would God have responded, do you think? 
But I'm chopping you off. That's, it. That's the end of your reign. That's the end of your reign. Thank you for what you've done, but I've got to get somebody else. I tell you what, we've got, to, we've got to watch what comes out of our mouth. We can speak death to ourselves. We can speak death and discouragement to our family, to our wives, to our children, to our church. Be careful. Speak life. Speak blessing. Speak healing. Speak wholeness. I tell you, that's one way we stand. It really is. And so, you know, uh, the, he, he, he said, and then, of course, it goes on from there. And it says, shall I pursue? God says, yes. And it says, David went. David pursued. David smote. And David recovered all. Huh? Isn't that powerful? Aggressive. He took the initiative. And so likewise with us, we've got to know how to take the initiative. And I think we, you know, in our war room this week, I think we've got some good strategies. You know, as far as where we're going, what to do. Glory to God. <laughs> so watch out. Glory to God. It's uh, <clears throat> strong self-defense. I tell you, David was hostile against his enemies. And David took the initiative. I tell you, you, you have to know what you're fighting for. You've got to love what you're fighting for. And you've got to fight with passion. Know what you're fighting for. Love what you're fighting for. And fight with passion. Do you remember in the book of Nehemiah, where Nehemiah, you know, the, he, he, got the, 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 he went back to Jerusalem. He says, we need to rise up and build. You know, our people are a reproach. We've got to rise up and build. And then as soon as he started to rise up and build Jerusalem, the enemy saw what they're doing. And the enemy came in to try and stop them. And then in chapter four, he said, we've got to rise up and fight. I tell you, every time you try to build, you, you make a commitment in your local church to, to try and build the youth group, try and build the children's ministry, try and build the usher ingredient, try and build a small group. You know what? There's going to be some opposition. There's got to be some opposition. You've got to know how to fight. He came and I tell you, when they came to fight, he said, now you've got to rise up and fight. We're primarily, we're not fighters. We're builders. But every time we try to build, there's somebody trying to stop you, like with Dr. J. I mean, here he is. He got 3,000 radical Hindus and, and, and he can go on for another three or four days there. And a lot of times they got lots of Muslims in there as well. And it's amazing how many get saved. But the opposition to that and then his willingness to get up there. I mean, they could stone him. They could put bombs under those platforms, anything. So you're taking a risk. You know, I know, I know a few years ago, I went to Pakistan there to our victory churches there. And I think you're going, who's it going in? Yeah, Kelly's going in January. And I'll tell you what, I, it was the 10th anniversary over in our Victory Churches of Pakistan. And I thought, uh, and Peter asked me, can you come over here? You've never been over here. Can you come over to do the 10th anniversary? And of course I thought, I said, well, uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't too excited about going there, you know, to Pakistan. And I says, well, uh, I said, let me check. Anyway, I got a hold of I, I, I yeah. I tried to get a flight from the USA. They canceled all my credit cards. They're just trying to get a ticket. Canceled all my credit cards. And not only that, um, the, and <laughs> the, the, I couldn't get a flight. I couldn't get anything down in the USA, you know, to go to Pakistan. And so I told Peter, I said, Peter, I'm sorry. Look, you know, I tried, you know, I tried everywhere. They canceled my credit cards. They couldn't do this. I'm sorry, I can't make it. And he says, well, you know, there was some other people came and they got a, they got a, a visa from Vancouver. And I said, oh. <laughs> he says, do you think you can get one from there? I said, well, I'll tell you what, Pastor Morris is opening the church there. I'll go up and, and, and be there with Pastor Morris for opening the church. And at the same time, I'll kind of check and see if I can get a visa. And so Hazel phoned up the Pakistani embassy there. And she said to them, uh, do we have to come in early? Will there be a line up? Oh, no, just come in. <laughs> <laughs> We went there. We were the only ones, you know. There's, there's nobody else. That, you know, and, and it was number 35, and I think that was for the whole year. You know. <laughs> and so, you know, so I took it. And, and anyway, you know, we ended up getting a, 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 a visa. And of course, even just having that visa, the whole page of your passport, Victory Churches, Pakistan, you're going to Pakistan. So you get questioned everywhere. You know, when I, when I came back, they asked me, so what are you doing over there? I said, we did some Christian we did some, built some churches and, you know, oh, wow, that's good. You know, then, you know, when we got back to the U.S. and back to Canada. But uh, anyway, you know, it was one of the best things I did when I went there. Because, you know, they had me doing an outside crusade. Outside crusade in Pakistan. And that was the last night. So I made my will out before I went. <laughs> I did, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. 
An outside crusade in Pakistan? Where is it? Where's it? Andy's with us. Where's Andy? Yeah, Andy came with us. That's when he had braids in his hair. He was a, he was a real novelty. They loved him there. You know, he got that long hair, long blonde hair there. He's, you know, head and shoulders above everybody else. He's got these braids. And he's playing with the guitar. And he's got the eyes. And he jumped down the road. You know? <laughs> so he was a major draw, you know. <laughs> so he was on the stage at the same time. And then the lights went out, didn't they? In the middle of the crusade, the, the lights went out. Of course, you got the guys with all shotguns on the different corners and that. And then, uh, so I just kept preaching anyway. I had an altar call. And the people came to the altars and it was packed. And I thought afterwards, you know, and then there was one town. There was, there, over in Pakistan, there was a, uh, there was one town called Victor. They actually building a, 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 a subdivision um, onto um, Lahore. And he asked Peter if there was a name that they, want, that they could name it. And he said, can we call it Victory Town? And so we went there and dedicated it. Victory Town. And we, Hazel bought a piece of land there and we built a church there. In Victory Town in Pakistan. <laughs> Glory to God. Yeah. And then not only that, there was a group from Sweden that actually gone over there and they built a 10,000 square feet building for Christian purposes. And, 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 and when they did that, they couldn't find any Christian purposes. <laughs> and so we ended up getting the land, a, a, a lifetime entitlement on it. And we started a new Victory Church and a, and a school there. You know, it's incredible. I came back there just totally thrilled. The schools that they had there were absolutely amazing. But he's stepping out and doing something. There's opposition. There's opposition to you getting saved. There's opposition to your family getting saved. There's opposition to you coming to church. There's opposition to you taking a, taking a, 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 committing yourself to do anything in the church. The devil don't mind you coming to church. It's when you come to church and do something. That's what he don't like. The cripple got healed up, jumped right in the center of the church. I tell you, that's what we need to do when you say, jump right in the center of the church. What can I do? How can I help? I tell you, we need to be, get involved and make that commitment. That's when God reveals himself. Commitment is the biggest battles I face there. But I tell you what, commitment's also the place of separation. It separates the winners from the whiners. Huh? If you don't ask for commitment, you're going to lose people. If you do ask, you're going to lose people. It's just you lose a different kind. If you ask for commitment, you'll lose the whiners. If you don't ask for commitment, you lose the winners. So you've got to ask yourself, who do I want to lose? Winners or whiners? Ask for commitment. Ask for commitment. Not little commitments, ask for big commitments. And see what they do. Jesus never asked for little commitments, did he? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow me. Are you in? Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Now, follow me. <laughs> I tell you, Jesus is much easier to worship and admire than what he is to follow. Isn't that right? Much easier to, much easier to jump up and down and praise him than what he is to follow. He says, follow me and I'll make you into something tomorrow. You're not today. So all we got to do is know where he's going and follow him. As we follow him, he changes us and molds us and makes us and shapes us into his image. So you can see more, do more, be more than anybody ever dreamed that you could be. And so you tap into that law of the spirit of life, it'll take you higher than you ever thought you could ever go. And it'll cause you to do more than you ever thought you could do. And so I'll tell you what, it's very exciting. I, I, you know, I always wondered, what could possibly be exciting about being a Christian? I mean, I've never seen a happy one. And, and anyway, what do they do? I mean, I know what they don't do. And, 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 and everything they don't do, I mean, it's everything I enjoy, they don't do. So what am I going to do? <laughs> You know, everything I enjoy is, is immoral, it's illegal, it's unethical, you know. And, I mean, isn't that the way you thought? But it's not till after you make the commitment. You made that decision, you realise, man, he don't take anything away from you without replacing it with something a hundred times better. And all of a sudden, many you think, thank God I made that decision. Thank God I made that, praise God. You make that decision, all of a sudden you get your joy, you get your victory, you get accomplishments, the satisfaction, glory to God. You get a marriage that stays together. 
You got a wife that still loves you? And you love her? Man. My wife's going over next week to dedicate our great, great grandchild. Our first one, yeah. Great, great. Man, I always wanted to get great in my name somewhere. So <laughs> I'm great, great granddad George. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, when we were over in, that, in, the, in the Maritimes last time, we stayed in the Great George Hotel. Yeah, I got my picture taken outside of it, the Great George. And then I said to everybody, who's Great George? And, and, they, and they said, well, I don't know. I said, well, can you find out? They asked the manager, he don't know. I said, you got anybody higher you can ask? Who's this Great George? I want to know, my name's George. The street's called George. The hotel's called George. Who's Great George? Finally, about two days later, they came back. Oh, we found out who he was. He was King George IV. Oh, you mean the one that they call the wicked King George in the USA? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Glory to God. Anyway, that's got nothing to do with my message, by the way. So, you know, but you do have to be aggressive. You've got to be aggressive against sin and destructive habits and behavior in our lives. We've got to be aggressive in prayer and praise and worship. We've got to be aggressive in our pursuit of God, God's will for our lives, aggressive in our witnessing and testimony to the lost, aggressive in our giving. And when we aggressively pursue our God-given purpose, God's provision and protection and power come right along with it. That's the beauty, isn't it? I mean, he's not going to ask you to do something and not provide for you. This is the beauty with Holy Spirit directed. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. He, we, get, we get into him where the Holy Spirit begins to reveal his will and his plan. And we want Holy Spirit directed and powered service. Separate Paul and Barnabas for the work I've called to do. They laid their hands on them and released them. I tell you, with that, when, when, what, what that means, it means Holy Spirit directed and empowered service. What it means, it means that you'll have the authority you need You'll have the resources you need. You'll have the favor you need, but not without opposition. I mean, the apostle Paul was released there. And then you see in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, he says, Satan hindered me. And in one place he went to, the sorcerer withstood him. Remember that? Yeah. And he had to confront him. You child of the devil, you son of all unrighteousness. When will you not cease to pervert the ways of the Lord? Struck him blind. Yeah. Huh? That's the lion, the face of the lion. You know, we need the face of the lion too and the face of the eagle where you can fly high and, you know, and above the pressures of life. And then the, and then the, the, the ox is like the, 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 the servant of God, the miracle working, tireless servant of God. And then in Luke, he's the man, his humanity. He can identify with each one of us. He knows what we're going through because he went through everything like we did. We don't have a high priest that can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows exactly how each one's feeling in this place. He knows our failures. He knows our discouragements. He knows our hurts. And he's the one that can heal them. He can put your whole life back together in a wonderful way. He really can. And you know, we're all, we're all dysfunctional in a lot of ways, aren't we? We all come from dysfunctional families, really. And, uh, and we all need a lot of healing in a whole variety of ways. And it doesn't all happen at once. It's a process. You wouldn't recognize yourself if it made you perfect right away, would you? Have you ever noticed the scripture just says this one thing? What, what lack I yet, Lord? I mean, that religious guy. What do I lack? Is there anything I like? I, like, I mean, I, you know, I keep the Ten Commandments. I do this, I do that. Is there anything yet I lack? And Jesus said, oh, yeah, one thing. He says, what's that? Go sell everything you have <laughs> and give it to the poor. And he went away sorrowful. Yeah. So he really just, he, he's really just proved that he wasn't obeying all the commandments. Yeah. Huh? I tell you, but every time we obey, on the other end of our obedience, God has something powerful, not only for you, but others yeah. as well. He wants to bless people through you. So our life and our future is not just about us. We fight for our future. You've got to fight for your future. Caleb had to fight for his. Paul had to fight for his. You've got to fight for your future. If you don't fight for it, you'll miss it. Amen. Glory to God, you've got to fight for it. And your future's worth fighting for. You're fighting for your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your church, your nation. So your future's not just about you. 
It's all of those that can be changed through your witness and through your testimony. Glory to God. So strategy, there's offensive, there's defensive stuff, but there's offensive stuff. I think we've got to get on the offensive. You know, we really do, especially in these next few years. Offensive action is a vital part of strategic warfare. Preemptive attack, attacks. Instead of us just responding to what the devil's doing. You know, the devil wiped out, you know, our, our Christian prime minister and, and now we got whatever we got, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Which we pray for him anyway. It says the king's heart's in the hands of the Lord. And he can turn it like rivers of water. He can turn it whichever way he wants. You know, and I tell you, so, we, so let's pray this guy gets saved. You know, and changed. You know, really. And that can happen. God can do that. He really can. And we're told to pray for the, whoever's in, in authority. Whoever's there, we're told to pray for them. So we should pray for them and believe, you know, uh, for change to take place. I mean, man, we got changed, didn't we? I mean... God didn't save you because you were lovable. <laughs> Did he? He didn't say, well, he's a real nice guy. I think I'll go down and save him. Look how, look, look how generous he is to people and how he loves people. I've got to save this one. Huh? I don't think he said that about any one of us. He says he loved us when we're still sinners. Didn't he? We're still a sinner. You know, and, but he loved us when we were like that. And he still saved us. He still died for us. Glory to God. So, you know, I mean, hey, all of the ugly people that you know, I mean, hey, there's hope for them. Only in Christ. Do you know, do you know down, in, down in Anaheim, a few years ago, I got, I got a poster of it still. You know, I started a, an Arabic church down there along with the churches. And I, and I, I did, a, I, I did a, a, there was a conference they put on for Jews and Muslims. And, uh, and it was in the Hilton Hotel in Anaheim. And they asked me to come and be the speaker and then share communion with them. So I went down there and the name of the conference was can my enemy be my friend? And it says, Taysir and Moran say yes. Taysir was a Muslim Palestinian terrorist and Moran was a Jewish soldier. And they both emigrated to the United States, hated. This one hated Palestinians, this one hated Jews. Man, you know. But you know what? They both got saved. Independently, they both received Christ. And when they received Christ, they ended up becoming the best of friends. And of course, you know, when I taught there, I taught all of them. And you know what I taught on? I taught on from Acts chapter 9. Here's Paul killing Christians. You know, and it says, and then he met the resurrected Christ. And when he met the resurrected Christ, his nature was changed. His character was changed. His relationships were changed. His mission was changed. His destiny was changed. Everything was changed. That's what happens when you meet the resurrected Christ. That's what happened to Taysir. That's what happened to Moran. I tell you what, the only answer to the Middle East is Jesus. And that's the one they're keeping out. But he's the only answer. He's the only answer. There is no other answer. There is no other peace plan. You want a peace plan for the Middle East? Man, it's Isaiah 60, uh, Psalm 67, the missionary psalm. Jesus, give him Jesus. And I tell you, change hearts, change lives. He's the Prince of Peace. And there can be peace and unity and harmony. I tell you, offensive action. I tell you, we gotta, we gotta get, we gotta get, you know, begin to, you know, preemptive action to the place where we're not responding just to what the devil's doing. How about him responding to what we're doing? Remember the guys where it says, these men, these are the group that have turned the world upside down and they're coming to your place. Huh? These guys turned the world upside down. I mean, they're winning souls, building churches, healing people, casting out devils and they're coming to your place. We are in a battle. I tell you, we do a lot less fighting in the natural if we fought in the spiritual. We're called to fight. We need to learn how to fight. We need to learn how to fight. You need to learn how to, you need to, learn how to cast devils out. You need to recognize territorial spirits, you know, like in Daniel chapter 10, where you can come across against territorial spirits in prayer firstly, and then you preach against them. You can preach against those spirits, and then you can act in the opposite spirit. Man, you got a stingy spirit in your area? Become generous. Man, you got a complaining spirit? Watch your words. You can change it. You can break that thing through prayer, acting in the opposite spirit, preaching messages against it. Change the climate. Hey, isn't that what happened in, uh, in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus sent the guys out, sent them out. They went out and he came back in Luke 10 verse 17. It says, and they came out, Master, even the devils are subject to us in your name. 
And Jesus said, don't rejoice over that, but rejoice in that your name's written in the book of life. And then he said, when you were out there, I saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. Huh? When you were out there casting out devils, healing the sick, winning people to Christ, getting them salvation, I saw Satan fall from heaven. His influence over that area got weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and the kingdom of God got stronger and stronger and stronger. I love what Brian Hyde Bonke said. We plunder hell and populate heaven. I tell you what, as, you know, with, with, uh, with offensive strategies, we got to hit the enemy where it hurts. Don't you, you attack uh, where it hurts. Where does it hurt? We steal his congregation. Huh? Sure, we plunder hell. Populate heaven. Every person that gets saved immediately is translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. From the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of his dear son. Man, they get a new life, new master, new rules and principles to live by, and new power to be able to do it. Wow, what a deal, huh? So, you know, we, we, gotta, we, gotta, we gotta keep hitting away. That's what, I, that's what I like. We gotta do that in Canada. We gotta plant some great churches here. You know, I tell them, you know, and, and, and see, another strategy of warfare is concentration of force, isn't it? Your concentration of force. We're gonna focus on something. This is what we're doing this week. We're going to focus on something. I said, you know, one thing I want to see. I want to see, uh, and somebody's going to do it somewhere in our organization. I want to see us, and I've mentioned it time and time again. I want to see us do what Jesus did on the day of Pentecost, where we start a church with 3,120. First service. Had 120 people. And they were, I mean, after three years ministry, Jesus just had 120 120 in the upper room, they're all fully devoted, committed, they're all of one mind, one spirit, one purpose. They're going to strive together for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. When they all got filled with the Holy Spirit, the upper room couldn't contain them. Jerusalem couldn't contain them. Judea couldn't contain them. And he took the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. 3,000 souls. Peter stood up and preached one message. 3,000 souls got saved. And then after that, then they began to minister to the, to the 3,000, 120 ministers to the 3,000. And then right after that, when they, when they became assimilated, then God let Peter and John do a miracle. He did the miracle where he healed the cripple. And when the cripple, cripple got healed, 5,000 men got saved. Wow. I tell you, do you think there's any relationship there? Sure there is. We've got to do things responsibly. We've got to do things responsibly. I tell you, God doesn't just perform a miracle for nothing. That miracle goes beyond somebody just getting healed. A miracle goes beyond just somebody getting delivered. It's what glory God that brings to God and how God can use that to touch the lives of others in a powerful way. And God's thinking about that. So this is why we get ready, get ready. The words come over time and time again. Get ready, get prepared. Get ready, get ready. You know, Joshua 3 and verse 5, it says, it says, sanctify yourself against tomorrow. Get ready for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders in your midst. We've got to get ready. Prepare tomorrow's leaders today. Make tomor tomorrow's disciples today. Build tomorrow's teams today. Get tomorrow's strategies today. Buy tomorrow's properties today. Let's do tomorrow's thing today. So we're not behind the eight ball all the time. We're thinking ahead, glory to God, so that we can do some things that makes the devil react. Man, I got to respond to those guys rather than us responding to him all the time. You know? I mean, we've, 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 we've been on the aggressive here in Canada. It can happen here. You know, I was so proud, you know, of Canada around the world. You know, the way we were in this last 10 years. Some of the decisions that were made were incredible. Inspired people all around the world. This country was number one in the world. Number one. You know, and... and, and uh, and, and, and it only becomes that way, it says, when, it says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Right. When the wicked are in authority, the people mourn. And wicked doesn't mean they're really wicked, terrible people. It just means they don't know Christ. They don't know what's right. Sometimes they just don't want truth. You know? I mean, you, I, 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 more than anything, you just got to love truth. You know what I'm saying here tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, there's, there's a... You know, the, the principles of warfare, there's offensive action. You've got to attack him where it hurts. Concentration of force, this one thing I do. And then there's the principle of perseverance. 
you know, the perseverance is 98% perspiration, 2% inspiration. They said the only place in the Bible where success comes before work is in a dictionary. <laughs> it's the only place where work comes before success. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's, you know, it, 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 in the dictionary, you've got work last, or work first and then success. You know, we, we got to work, but in the dictionary, it's the other way around. So we got to get it so that we work. I mean, it's, it's hard work. It really is sometimes. The Bible is not a get-rich-quick book. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's not get-healed-quick book. No, this is a work book. This is something where you've got to take these principles and apply them in your life, apply them in your marriage, apply them in your church, apply them in your finances. It means you've got to make a commitment somehow to get involved. Not just get saved, but then get involved. Jump right into the center of the church and be God's man in that church. I tell you what, God blesses your family, blesses your business, and blesses everything. He really does. You know? Perseverance. I mean, look at the Apostle Paul. I mean, nothing stopped him. I mean, shipwrecked, beaten, flogged, starved, chained, put in the stocks and jails, everything. They did everything to him, but nothing could stop him. Why? Because he had a God-given purpose. That was bigger than him. Glory to God. And it's something he was willing to die for. Something worth living for. Something worth dying for. Glory to God. I tell you, that's the kind of attitude that we got. This is worth dying for. Even me going to Pakistan. I was, I mean, I was, I was, I was willing to die. You know, I know what's going I mean, hey, it's no big deal to me. You know, I know they shoot me. I know where I'm going. If ever you hear George Hill is dead, don't believe it. I'll be more alive than I ever was. <laughs> I don't know why people, I don't know why Christians are afraid of dying. I mean, what, I mean, what's the worst they could do to you? Absent from the body is what? Be present with Christ. You know, and then you, you're in a position then to get your new body, one that never grows old, one that never embarrasses you, one that can do all kinds of things this one can't do. That's what it says in the living Bible. Yeah, sure. Glory to God, we have some great stuff to look forward to. We really haven't. It's not going to be too far away either. I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe in the rapture. I believe in the pre-trib rapture. And I know even, even in the news, on the news just a, just a uh, I think it was last week, the NBC News in the USA, it says within three years, every American citizen will have to have a chip in their body. That's what it says in the news. And then Hazel said to me, are you going to do that? I said, I'm not doing it. Because I know what it says. It says, if you do that, it says the smoke of your torment will go up forever. You'll get tied into the Antichrist system and the smoke of your torment goes up forever. You know, I mean, whether that happens in three years or not, they're thinking that way. Because it makes sense from an economical standpoint. I mean, if you put a chip in your body somewhere, there'd be no need for credit cards, no need for cash, no need for checks, all of the things that cause fraud, and crimes, there'd be no money crimes, there'd be no credit card crimes, there'd be no identity theft. Huh? So you can see it just makes sense. But it's hidden there years ago. And it's told us what's going to happen. And that's in Revelation chapter 13. <laughs> you know, so hey, as far as the rapture is concerned, there's no, it doesn't take any sign. There's no sign. No, nothing needs to be fulfilled. Everybody has had that hope of the rapture where the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. There should no comfort if you think you've got to go through the tribulation. Is there? And that's no comfort thinking about the 75 pound hailstones that are coming. It's no comfort thinking about all the sea, you know, turning into blood and all the fish dying. You know, it's no comfort, you know, thinking about all the stuff that's going to happen in those last few years. You know, and then of course it talks about all the beheading, those that do receive Christ. I mean, it talks about, I mean, you can see it already happening now, can't you? I mean, look what they're doing now. Who are they beheading? Christians. Yeah. And of course, it's all prophesied. I mean, you know, you almost, I mean, it, it's, the writing is on the wall. Yeah. Knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. 
Glory to God. And then put off the works of the devil and put on the armor of light. Man, let's make a difference. Let's make a difference. You know, we're here for a purpose. Even the last few years of our lives, man, let's do something. Let's, let's, let's do something in Canada. You know, uh, you know, your loved ones. I mean, let's, let's fight for them. Fight for your wives. Fight, for your, fight for, your, for your children. Fight for your friends. Fight for your lands. Fight for your freedoms. It's a battle that we're in. We've got to know how to fight. You know, people have lost the will and the skill on how to fight. I think we've been complacent for too long. I think we've been comfortable for too long. Uh, and I think we've been slaves for too long to the place where we lose the will and we lose the skill on how to fight. Glory to God. I tell you, I'm not talking about fighting. I'm talking now, fighting in the spirit realm. We're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. It talks about in Second Chronicles chapter 18, it talks about a conference in heaven that determined how the battle on earth was going to turn out. Have you heard that with King Ahab? You know, the prophecy, the prophet told him exactly how it was going to turn out. King Ahab was going to get killed in the battle. It didn't matter what he did to hide himself. Somebody just drew a random arrow straight through his armor. The one weak spot killed him and he died. I tell you, you can't hide from God. God is God and he'll do what he, he you know, he, he, he's uh, behold the goodness <clears throat> And the severity of God. I think, you know, what's happened today, which has put a lot of Christians to sleep. See, if the devil could, the devil wants to make peace with the church. He does. He and a lot of the church he's made peace with. You know, we're a peaceful religion. You know, yeah. We are peaceful. Boom. <laughs> does he think we're stupid? No. You know, I mean, we got to, we got to. We've got to realize, man, it is a war. We are in the middle of a war, but he wants to make peace. I mean, look how he's made peace with the church. We're all of a sudden now they're accepting, you know, they're accepting gay marriage, accepting homosexuality. They're accepting all of the things that were illegal from a biblical standpoint 10, 15, 20 years ago. I mean, that's the reason Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Do you think God's changed? No, he hasn't. Their sayings and doings are against the Lord. And I tell you what, at this election, this last one, I could see the majority of the people in Canada, their sayings and doings are against the Lord. And that's, that's a dangerous position to be. But it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and what? Turn from their wicked ways. Then God says, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. And I'll heal the land. So the God is squarely placing the responsibility for the healing of the land, not on our politicians. Who's he putting it on? The church, my people. And thank God there's quite a few politicians in Canada that are his people. They're Christians. And I thank God for that. We just need to pray for more of them and believe for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Why don't we just stand together? Let's pray for that.